Hello everybody, my name is John Hickey and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge. But today I'm actually going to talk about work I did during my PhD at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland, where I worked with uh, Professor Brian Broderick. And specifically, I'm going to talk about some work we did looking at the development of a rapid seismic loss assessment framework for steel concentrically braced frames designed to Eurocode 8. And I suppose, as I said in the title, and this work deals with steel concentrically braced frames or steel CBFs. And as I'm sure many people are aware, these are steel structures that look like this in the little diagram here on the right, where uh, lateral strength is supplied by uh, diagonal bracing members. And I suppose like most frames that are designed in accordance with modern codes, steel CBFs are unlikely to suffer collapse even under very high intensity earthquakes. However, that doesn't mean everything is perfect and they can still suffer significant losses uh, due to damage to both structural and particularly non-structural components over uh, a wide range of potential earthquakes that may occur. And I suppose this um, idea of suffering losses, even if collapse is not, not likely, um, is, is applicable to nearly all uh, frames designed in accordance with modern codes. And I suppose that over the last 25 years, 30 years, has led to, to the development of the concept of performance-based earthquake engineering, where we try and assess a building's performance over a range of earthquakes that may occur and ask um, if that performance is adequate. And I suppose it's, performance can be a difficult thing to measure. Um, but often we use economic losses as a metric uh, to try and get a handle on this. And I suppose that's a couple of reasons for that. But uh, one is that uh, losses are a metric that is understandable to everyone, unlike, say, for example, um, interstory drift or member forces, which are maybe only meaningful uh, to the structural engineer. And I suppose the most up-to-date way we have of uh, calculating these uh, potential losses is using the FEMA P58 uh, loss assessment framework which, as I suppose the name suggests, was a method developed by FEMA in the US for this purpose. And this is basically, like all uh, performance-based earthquake engineering, a kind of a four-step process involving, in this case, the integration of four different probability distributions, one representing, in this case, the seismic hazard, a second representing the structural response to this hazard, a third then representing the probable level of damage that we're going to get given uh, the structural response, and a final distribution representing um, what we expect our performance to be given the expected level of damage. And I suppose this four-step process is illustrated on the right here. And the one that we're really interested in in this presentation is uh, the prediction of structural response, or what would be known maybe in the performance assessment world as the prediction of key engineering demand parameters, or EDPs, which um, for performance assessment, the two that we really want to look at, for brace frames at least, are peak interstory drift and peak floor acceleration. And typically how we would go about calculating these is we would somehow select um, a set of ground motions that we think is appropriate or representative of the ground motions that are likely to be experienced by a structure. And then we would perform lots and lots of non-linear time history analyses uh, using these ground motion records. And from that, we would extract um, our key EDPs, namely drift and acceleration. Um, but we would argue that this is probably, probably not ideal um, because carrying out lots of non-linear time history analyses is technically challenging. So it's difficult to select appropriate records and to develop a really good accurate model. And also then it takes a lot of time to run all these analysis. And I suppose that's particularly the case if we're doing this in a performance-based seismic design um, um, scenario, where we have a design, we assess its performance, and then we redesign, perhaps iterate, and ultimately end up carrying out lots and lots of iterations of nonlinear analysis. So I suppose ultimately um, this is, it can be impractical uh, to implement in an industry environment because of the comp difficulties and computational demands involved. Um, so I suppose this leads to a kind of a kind of a contradiction. We have on the one hand the case that we want um, to assess performance if we want to design better buildings, but on the other hand we have the case that it's kind of impractical to do so. So I suppose this leads to the, the questions that we want to ask or have a look at in this paper, which is firstly, can we develop a method to predict these key EDPs whilst avoiding nonlinear uh, time history analysis and therefore make um, performance assessment more practical? And then if we develop such a method, can it be used uh, to give a, a reasonably good estimate of the economic losses or how do those losses that we get from a, a quick method compare to um, the losses we would get using a conventional time history analysis approach. Uh, so as I say, we have two questions. And as I said, the, the, the first of those is, can we develop a method to predict uh, these key EDPs? And how we've gone about trying to do that in this paper is uh, by designing a large set of archetype uh, brace frames in accordance with Eurocode 8. And then we've modeled each of these frames in open seas. And then we've selected a lot of ground motion records and carried out lots and lots and lots of nonlinear time history analysis. And that gives us a kind of a large data bank 
where we record um, the peak interest rate drift, or peak floor acceleration, and we get a large data bank of these EDPs, and then we try and fit some regression equations to these that we can use to predict the response of other frames. Um, so I suppose here are the, this slide shows the, the, the various archetypes that we use for this process. As you can see, there's 24 different archetypes ranging from two to seven stories uh, designed to Eurocode um, and for a range of, of soil types and, and ground accelerations. And all of these were modeled in Open Seas. And Open Seas, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a finite element type software developed in Berkeley in the US for nonlinear seismic analysis primarily. And there's details here of how the modeling is done, but I won't go into too much depth because there's nothing too, too unorthodox, uh, I would say, in the, in the approach we adopted to the modeling. Um, then the analysis procedure we adopted is based on work that's been done in Imperial College in London by a couple of these studies. And basically that involves uh, selecting a large set of ground motion records and scaling those ground motion records um, so that we induce a, spe a specific level of inelasticity in the frames you want to look at. And that's controlled by this uh, Q value here, which people might be familiar for, with from the Eurocode. And we've kind of scaled our records to uh, induce Q values of 1.5, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Mm -hmm. uh, and these uh, gives us a set of a large set of uh, ground motion records that we want to apply to our uh, models of our uh, archetype frames. And in each of these models, we record the peak interstory drift and peak floor acceleration at each floor level. And then uh, before we go on to performing regression analysis with this data, uh, we normalize it. And we do that for drift by normalizing it by basically the um, equivalent elastic drift. And that gives us what's sometimes known as the uh, peak drift modification factor. Uh, and we do it, normalize our accelerations uh, by the peak ground acceleration, which gives us something that's sometimes called the peak uh, acceleration magnification factor. And I suppose there are a number of reasons why we do this. Um, but I suppose primarily uh, that's, uh, it allows us to compare uh, the metrics to values that are given in the Eurocode quite easily. So Eurocode always predicts a value of one for this um, drift modification factor, and it always predicts this linear profile over the frame height uh, for uh, the acceleration magnification, uh, ranging, from the peak, ranging from being equal to the peak ground acceleration at the ground level to being equal to 2.5 times the peak ground acceleration at roof level. And I suppose the next couple of, couple of slides then uh, give some example results. So we can see here uh, the example results for the three story archetypes with all the various uh, ground motions applied and the median response uh, shown in the dark blue lines and um, the, the, the values predicted by Eurocode for normalized drift and normalized acceleration given in the top line and the bottom line respectively. Uh, and we can see there quickly how, how, those, um, how the Eurocode values compare to the values that we get from nonlinear time history analysis for a three story archetype. And then this slide shows similar results for one of the six story archetypes, where again, we see how the Eurocode in green compares with the values we got from uh, time history analysis in blue. So we do this, kind of produce the previous slide, if you like, for 24 different archetypes, and that gives us lots and lots of data points. And then we try and fit a regression equation to it. This is the equation we came up with for uh, the normalized drift. Um, and I suppose as anyone who's ever tried to fit a regression equation knows this can be kind of a trial and error process and involves lots of different iterations, but ultimately we settled on this equation here for our normalized drift. And we settled on this nonlinear equation here uh, for our, our normalized acceleration. So the next question is then, well, are those equations any good or how do those equations perform? And we've assessed this here for a couple of example cases um, that weren't used in the training data or weren't used in the data that was employed to develop the regression equations. The first of these is the three-story archetype for S-frame, again designed to Eurocode 8. Um, and we can see we get the blue lines, which are the results that we get when we carry out non-linear time history analysis with lots of ground motion records uh, are in blue, as I say, and the results from our uh, regression equation are in red. And we can see here for this three-story case, uh, we get a reasonably good match, not perfect, but reasonably good for both normalized drift and normalized acceleration. And we have another example here of a five-story case where again, we get good matches generally um, in nearly all cases. And for a seven-story uh, archetype example, again, where we get reasonably good matches uh, in nearly all cases. So I suppose we're at this point now where we have, we appear to have, um, regression equations that can do a reasonably good job of predicting what our median 
um, EDPs, peak drift and peak floor acceleration are going to be. So then the question is, um, can this, these, these rapid EDP uh, predictions, can they be used to estimate economic losses? And how we've tried to answer that question is we try to assess losses for three case study uh, brace frames, a three story, a five story and a seven story structure. And we've calculated, I suppose, what are benchmark losses using a conventional time history analysis approach and compared them to the losses we get using um, our regression equations to predict the EDPs. In terms of the loss assessment itself, um, I'll go through this quite quickly. It's been carried out using the FEMA P58 methodology, which I think I mentioned briefly at the start. And we execute this using uh, something known as the PACT tool. Uh, and that's basically a tool developed by FEMA to implement their methodology that takes in EDPs and outputs um, repair costs. And we've done the loss calculation at eight different ground motion intensity levels. Uh, and then using kind of a weight of some of these answers, uh, we can calculate the expected losses over, for this case, a 50 year, 50 year lifetime. And in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to compare losses from our rapid EDP prediction approach to conventional uh, time history analysis uh, EDP prediction for losses at the 2%, 10%, and 50% in 50 year earthquakes, which are sometimes known as the maximum credible earthquake, design level earthquake, service level earthquake. And also we're going to compare the losses we get over the lifetime of the frame. So we have here, uh, firstly, um, a the example results for the tree story, uh, case study CBF. We have the losses broken down into drift sensitive components in blue and, and acceleration sensitive components in red with the overall losses given in green. And the losses from non-linear time history analysis are given on the left hand side of the plots and from the rapid approach from the regression equations given on the right hand side of the plots and we can see here that for the three intensity levels and for the overall lifetime losses we actually get a really really good match between the losses that we get from our uh, time history analysis and from our uh, regression equations and that's true also for uh, the five story case study example where we get again and for the seven story case study example where we get a good match in in most cases so i suppose overall then what this means is that um our regression equation approach is able to quickly much more quickly give a good approximation of the losses that we would get using the much more computationally intensive time history analysis approach and that means that our method is kind of really useful if we want to get a quick estimate of losses like for example in a case where we want to do some iteration or um at an initial estimation phase. So I suppose in summary then to wrap up quickly, what we've done is we've identified a need uh, for methods to predict EDPs without resorting to time history analysis. How we've tried to do that is through the development of regression equations, and we've shown uh, that we can get a good match of, of expected losses using this approach. So I suppose that's pretty much all I have to say. Thanks very much for listening to me, and I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.